Hi everyone, welcome to the Summer of Resistance webcast. Uh, we're really glad that you joined us today. Uh, I guess we'll start this webcast off by introducing ourselves. Uh, my name is Mary, I'm a campaigner with Greenpeace. Uh, my work involves working with communities and groups across the country who are fighting fossil fuel projects, mostly focused around offshore drilling. Hi, I'm Isabel. I'm a mobilization organizer with Greenpeace. And what that means is I get to work with volunteers all around the country working on Greenpeace campaigns. Hey everyone, I'm Harmony. I work on the actions team at Greenpeace um, where I do logistics as well as train activists in nonviolent direct action. I also fly a thermal airship. Nice. Well, first, thanks again for joining us. Um, we're really glad to be here with you today. And I think we know why we're all here. Uh, you know, we face serious attacks on our communities, on our environment, um, from the Trump administration um, and the oil and gas industries. Trump has repeatedly denied the science of climate change. He's packed the White House with fossil fuel industry cronies, oil executives, um, and he's given the thumbs up to destructive projects like the Keystone XL pipeline um, and the Dakota Access pipeline, which hundreds of people have been risking their lives, their bodies, their freedom for um, to protect their water uh, and the climate. And we have seen so many other bold re resistance actions against Trump's agenda. Um, in the video that you just saw, as I mentioned, we know that you and millions of Americans have been taking action. You've been signing petitions, you've been writing letters, you've been calling your representatives, um, and showing up to demonstrations and marches. And these are all important and necessary to, for the success of our movements. Um, but we know that you're here because you want to do more. Um, and so today, we're going to talk about peaceful direct action. Right now, we need to take action at a scale like never before. We can use action to protect each other, fight for each other, and reject all of the ways in which Donald Trump threatens our communities and our climate. The Greenpeace Summer of Resistance Project will help people step into the next phase of resistance and put nonviolent direct action skills to work. This webcast is the official kickoff. And we'll also be traveling to over 10 cities around the country to do day-long, in-person, nonviolent direct action trainings, starting in Chicago, July 1st and 2nd. If you want to find an in-person training near you, you can go to summerofresistance.org. We want to turn to the threats you all are facing and turn them into acts of creative resistance, all taking place between now and the last day of summer, September 22nd. After the trainings, people like you will host creative resistance actions across the country, focusing on issues that matter to you and your community. Now, Greenpeace has over 45 years of creative resistance experience, and we want to share what we've learned doing this work. We're going to be covering some of the basic things you'll need to know to host your own act of creative resistance. Today, we'll focus on three things. Why we need to escalate and take action how and why peaceful, nonviolent direct action works, and tips on how to host successful creative resistance actions. Harmony, can you give an example of how you're fighting back? Yeah, sure. Um, this year I've helped hundreds of people learn how to climb, and I've also trained them in nonviolent direct action so that they can take those skills back to their own communities to do a direct action. Um, in fact, after this webcast is done, I'm going to take public transit back to Oakland to teach people how to climb. That's awesome. Harmony is a great trainer. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, <Mary>. um, <laughs> Well, before we move on, um, I did want to welcome folks who may have just joined us. Um, so again, this is the Summer of Resistance webcast hosted by Greenpeace. Um, and this webcast is designed to be a short introduction to some of the ideas around peaceful pro protest and direct action. Um, and we'd like to take a minute now for you all to share um, what community you're coming from and what struggles you may be facing and what you're fighting for. So we want to invite you to use the Facebook comments section to introduce yourself, um, talk about the issues that your community is facing and why you're taking action. Um, and throughout the entire webcast, you can feel free to post comments there. Um, and our online editor, Ryan, will do his best to answer some of your questions um, there in the comments section. And if you're watching this with a group um, and not at your own computer, we just suggest that maybe you designate one person to be the person to take those questions and type them into the, the comments section for all of you. Um, and speaking of watching with a group, uh, right now folks are tuning in all across the country um, at webcast parties, as well as those of you who are tuning in on your own at your own computer. Yeah, like Terry and their group in Michigan. Hi, folks. Thanks for joining us. 
Cool. Now we're going to discuss um, why and how people take action. So people use nonviolent action to confront oppression, shift who holds power, draw attention to, or directly stop injustice as part of a larger effort to create change. Nonviolence is a means of resistance. For some people, nonviolence is a philosophy or a way of life, and for others, it's just a tactic. Nonviolent or peaceful resistance means doing our utmost to avoid physical or verbal violence while also remembering your personal safety is important. Greenpeace has used nonviolent direct action for 45 years, but direct action has had a long history of use from, from many movements for social change. Um, in these slides, there's going to be a few examples in no particular order. Um, so some examples include the American Indian Movement, the suffragists, abolitionists, labor activists, anti-war protesters, LGBT, LGBTQ activists, migrant rights, disability justice, and the civil rights movement, as well as many others. People and groups have been using creative resistance for a long time because it works. Now, nonviolent direct action is a broad term, and there's a really wide spectrum of what it actually looks like in practice. Boycotts, sit-ins, blockades, banner hangs, marches, street theater, the list goes on. There are examples from around the world and throughout history. As we move into talking about the strategy behind peaceful direct actions, we wanted to focus on a well-known example from US history, Rosa Parks and the Montgomery bus boycott campaign. This action was part of a strategic campaign for civil rights. Activist Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat to a white man on the segregated bus. If you're like me, you were taught in school that this was a spur-of-the-moment decision because Rosa Parks was tired that day. In reality, the community had spent several months preparing to use this tactic, and Parks was a trained activist. It was a kickoff action. Four days after her sit-in, the black community kicked off a boycott of Montgomery bus system that was key to desegregating public transport in that city. Uh, well, now we want to talk a little bit about the strategy behind the use of creative resistance. Um, and so in order to have a successful creative resistance or peaceful protest, you want to start with a solid strategy. So this means carefully thinking um, through about why you're doing this action and what you want to accomplish with it. Um, so here's a video to talk a little bit more about that. Hi, I'm Aniello Aliotto. I'm one of the global engagement managers for Greenpeace International. And we want to talk for just a quick minute about theories of change and what makes a good, strong theory of change. So every good strategy starts with a strong theory of change. And a lot of people think about theories of change as an if-then statement. So for example, if we get a lot of media attention on a uh, proposed pipeline or a protest to a proposed pipeline, then the mayor is more likely to speak out against that pipeline. Well, in the case of summer of resistance, a lot of our theories of change revolve around peaceful protest and nonviolent direct action and public attention towards those actions. And so one of the things that we want to think about is for every individual action uh, or protest, then what are the mechanisms for change? Who are the people that actually have the power to make change? What are the messages that they're receptive to and who are the people that they're accountable to? We're going to have a lot of time to think about theories of change during the brainstorm, but we just wanted to frame the conversation first. So in the big picture of a strategy, the peaceful protest or direct action is probably going to be one of many tools that a community will use in their toolbox, but it can be a really useful and effective one. Uh, one example that I'm familiar with um, that demonstrates direct action as part of a larger campaign strategy um, is from the campaign to stop Shell from drilling for oil in the Arctic Ocean. So the kind of backstory there is that in 2015, after years of local and indigenous um, support and environmental groups opposing Shell's efforts to drill for oil in the Arctic Ocean, trained Greenpeace climbers, including Harmony here, and local residents physically blocked a ship that was transporting Shell's drilling equipment from leaving the city of Portland, Oregon, um, and heading up to Alaska to start drilling. These folks did so by suspending themselves on ropes from a large bridge and occupying the river below in kayaks and in boats for about 40 hours. So this ultimately delayed Shell's drilling plans um, and their schedule, but it also motivated thousands of people who saw the action to call into the White House and put pressure on President Obama um, to protect the Arctic Ocean. 
Um, and that is actually what happened about a year later. He did put those protections in place. Unfortunately, Trump is now actively trying to undo those protections. Um, but that's why I think this conversation is that much more important today. Um, you know, and other recent examples of creative resistance and peaceful protests that folks are probably familiar with include the movement for black lives and the efforts to stop a Dakota Access Pipeline. Now we wanted to take a moment to answer some more of your questions that are coming in through Facebook. Um, so if you do have a question, put that in the comment section of the video. Um, this question is from Catherine, and it's particularly relevant given what you were just saying about the action in Portland. Um, but Catherine wants to know, how can climbing be a tool for resistance? And Harmony, you want to take that? Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, so I am involved a lot with climbing um, as a tool for activism. And I think exactly what Mary was just saying is a great example. Um, so in Portland, we suspended ourselves under the bridge and physically blocked the Finica, which was Shell's ship, um, from going under that bridge and delayed Arctic drilling for 40 hours. Another example of um, climbing being used in direct action is actually a great example right behind us of this resist banner. Um, people actually climbed up the, the crane in DC and then climbed across it and rappelled down or just go down the rope um, and dropped that banner, opened the banner up. And that banner was about three blocks away from the White House and was easily readable for, um, by Donald Trump, but was also really inspiring for the entire movement as well. Thanks, Harmony. Uh, so if you're just joining us, this is the Summer of Resistance webcast with Greenpeace. We're hoping through this webcast, our resource guide, and in-person trainings in over 10 cities around the country, that this summer will help build the resistance by inspiring hundreds of creative, nonviolent actions to happen before the last day of summer, September 22nd. More information can be found at summerofresistance.org. Now, let's take a few minutes to talk about what this type of resistance might look like for folks across the country. We want you to brainstorm around what issue your community is facing. Are the EPA budget cuts impacting your community? Are fossil fuel pipelines being proposed? Are you watching your friends, family, or neighbors be deported? Maybe you're witnessing Islamophobia, police violence, or LGBTQ discrimination. Once you've identified an issue that your community is facing that you really want to work on, the next step is to identify the solution. So what is ultimately the goal that you want to achieve? Um, I really encourage you to picture a world in which your community is safe and everyone is able to thrive, and then identify the steps that it would take to get you to that place. And then it's next, it's important to identify who can actually um, give what your community needs or wants. So who can make the decision that will lead to you achieving your goal? This could be a politician, it could be a CEO of a company. Regardless, this person is the ultimate decision maker um, and you will want to apply pressure on them um, in order to make them to take the right action. Um, and so once you have identified this person, it's important to reflect on how they can be influenced to make that decision. And sometimes the best option is to figure out ways that your community can stop um, whatever injustice is going on directly. Um, and oftentimes communities choose to stop an injustice directly when they've tried other ways to get a decision maker to listen to them, but they haven't had success. So for example, we see this often um, in the efforts for fair labor practices, when workers have tried to ask their management for better working conditions, but they, um, you know, nothing's really happening at first. After deciding on the path of how the decision maker can be influenced, it's time to dig into the specifics of your creative resistance action. Strategic creative resistance actions have a lot of moving parts, but here are some important components. A clear goal for the activity and how that goal moves you to the change you want. A clear strategy, who can give you what you want. Excuse me, a clear target of who can give you what you want a clearly identified audience, a message that will speak to your audience or gather public support, and also important is an exit strategy. How will you know when it's over? Your activity should be closely tied to what you want to achieve and the message you want to be heard. In choosing your activity, have the intended audience in mind and what they respond positively to. Your activity is how you communicate to your decision maker or is a direct result of your decision maker not responding to an injustice. 
It is also important to agree on the level of risk, whether it's legal, physical, or emotional risk that you are willing to take with your group, and the tone you would like your event to have. Remember, risk is different for each person. Consider how opposition, law enforcement, courts, and corrections will interact with your group. And remember that systemic racism, immigrant status, sexism, sexual orientation, and gender identity are all dynamics that will play out in a direct action. Now we're going to talk a little bit more about how to have a successful event. So we know the big goal we want to achieve, the person who can give us what we want and how they can be influenced, and the general creative resistance action we want to take. Let's make sure that action is a success. A successful creative resistance action requires some very careful planning. We've provided a creative resistance action plan to be used for getting started in, your, in planning your action. And again, be sure to have our resource guide handy as you fill out that plan. One really key piece is identifying key roles and making sure you have people to fill those roles. Some, some roles to think about are the overall action planner, the media and social media point person, someone to take care of safety and support for activists, someone to check out the location or locations ahead of time, someone to be in charge of any art you're creating, a police liaison, and someone to be in charge of potential post-action legal support and fundraising if needed. Not all of these roles will be needed for every action, and some can be doubled or tripled up. For instance, your art lead can also be your action planner. But the people who have the media and police liaison roles should not have additional roles because they can be all-consuming. Here are some other Greenpeace staff with some tips. Hi, I'm Lisa Ramsden and I work on Greenpeace's action team. Before your action, carefully think through logistics with your group. If possible, I'd recommend going to visit the site beforehand. If you want to bring a large number of people to your action or event, make sure the space that you're going to is big enough to fit everyone. Note what the sun is doing at different times of the day if you're hoping to get a good photo from your event. Make a list of all of the gear that you'll need, including things like cell phones, battery chargers, and cameras. Figure out how long your action will ideally last and create an exit scenario if possible. Hi, I'm Ebony Martin and I'm the Director of People and Culture here at Greenpeace and I'm going to talk to you about safety. On the day of the action, make sure that you have extra snacks and water because it'll probably be hot outside. Also make sure that you have sunscreen on hand and know where your public restrooms are. Additionally, you should be comfortable with the people that you are with and that you're able to share any experiences with you, them that might concern you. Also know if arrests are a possibility. And if that's the case, you should be prepared to deal with that and also know what that entails. Hi everyone, my name is Kylie and I'm a community management specialist here at Greenpeace in Washington, DC. And I'm Hannah, and I'm an organizer for the Summer of Resistance. And right now, we're going to talk about recruitment. So as you know, with any event that you're planning, it's incredibly important that you have a solid team working with you. So start by setting a number of people you want to see get involved in your event. Uh, you could be having a small targeted action where you only need enough people to fill key roles. Or maybe you're planning an action that creates a huge splash with 500 people, fireworks, and a parade. Regardless, you want to take that number of people you want to get involved and double it. And that's how many people you want to recruit for your event. Typically, only half of the folks who RSVP to an event will actually show up the day of. If your event does not include legal risk for participants, a great place to start is by posting your event on summerofresistance.org. But you can do even more to recruit. You can personally reach out to friends and family members. You can share your event on social media and through email. And you can also reach out to other local organizations to see if they want to get involved. Big or small, thank you so much for everything you're doing for the resistance. Back, Back to, to you, San, San Francisco. Francisco. And there's a lot more tips um, for creative nonviolence that you can find in a lot of different resources. But we highly suggest that you join one of our in-person trainings, um, which you can find more about that at summerofresistance.org. So it is entirely likely that there will be someone who sees your peaceful protest and does not agree with your viewpoint. Um, if they approach you, it is often good practice not to engage with them, but sometimes it becomes necessary to, to diffuse a tense situation. 
If you see someone who looks agitated or is approaching you quickly, consider, consider offering your hand, introducing yourself, and asking them their name to start a conversation. Um, here are three tips to de-escalate a situation. So non-confrontational body language. Think about what your body is like when it is relaxed. Take steady breaths to keep yourself calm. Match the volume of the other person and then steadily lower your voice to a normal speaking volume and move the conversation to the side of your group or event. Practice active listening. Empathize and validate where possible and explain the situation. It's important to make sure your whole group understands de-escalation concepts. We encourage folks to practice these techniques by thinking of possible realistic scenarios that may happen during your creative resistance action, and then practicing what you all would do in these scenarios. This can be really helpful as your group prepares. And now we have a video about considering potential legal risks. Hi, I'm Irene, and I'm a programs assistant here at Greenpeace. I'm definitely not a lawyer, but here are some things you should keep in mind. Peaceful creative resistance action doesn't have to risk breaking the law, and Greenpeace cannot give you legal advice, and this webcast should not be considered legal advice. Folks who are hosting a creative resistance actions are encouraged to contact a local criminal defense lawyer to determine whether or not there might be legal risks, as there might be other sorts of risks involving local and state laws. A nationally recognized resource is the National Lawyers Guild. However, you may find a resource locally that can help you. Involvement of the police and other authorities is also something that should be considered. Some people choose to have a permit when required for their march, for instance. Others choose to speak with their local police department before their event. Folks hosting creative resistant events need to decide what legal risks they are willing to take and what is going to work for them. Due to historical and current profiling, police violence, and law enforcement's cooperation with immigration and customs enforcement, it's important to remember many community members may not feel safe by police presence. Come to a consensus about how your group will interact with law enforcement, what reaction from law enforcement you expect, and the impact that will have on others. The legal system can be complicated and the outcome of arrests are different case by case. In general, if someone is advised that there is a risk of arrest, they should ask a lawyer what the process will be like and what to expect. Folks involved who are not risking arrest will also want to understand the systems to ensure that they can be ready and waiting to help ensure folks are released and supported. The legal process can be expensive. Many groups arrange a legal fund for bail money, legal fees, lost incomes, and fines that people may incur when arrested. Many crowdfunding sites have restrictions on how their platform can be used to fundraise. Check the terms and conditions of each site before starting a legal fee fund. Indiegogo and Funded Justice are two sites that have been used by different groups in the past, but we do not recommend or endorse any particular website. In the research guide, which you can find on the research page on summerofresistance.org, you'll also find more information like tips on interacting with law enforcement, what to bring and what not to bring to creative resistance actions, and links to other resources. If you have any questions, ask them on Facebook. We'll try to point you in the right direction. All right, and we're back. Uh, we're going to take a moment to answer some more of those questions that have come in from Facebook. Um, so first, Kay in Texas is wondering, how do we resist, how do we resist big oil in a state where the government is friendly with big oil? Sure. Mary. <laughs> yeah, I can uh, try to answer that question. It's a tough one. Um, I think a lot of communities across the country are in places where industry and their local elected officials um, have a pretty cozy relationship, so you're not alone. Um, I think that there are a couple different opportunities there. You can um, kind of start to do research in your community about what uh, elected officials, what their tie is to the industry, and see if you can expose that in any way um, to the public, to the media. Um, there may also be opportunities for direct action at infrastructure sites. Are there things that are going to be um, built in your area that you want to stop to protect your community? Um, so definitely hang in there, know that you're not alone, um, and I think you know, being involved in these kinds of conversations uh, hopefully will, will help support your community. That's a great transition into our next question. Um, Rebecca in San Francisco is wondering, what's the best way to start working with people in my area? Um, and one, I would say summerofresistance.org. That's where we're hoping all of you will 
post your events, post your meetings, um, so that other folks can type in their zip code and find a place to start working with other people that are interested in doing this work. Um, and then also, Rebecca, specifically, if you're in San Francisco, um, there are lots of local groups in the Bay Area that are doing this work, that are working on issues um, directly related to where you're where you're living. Um, so make sure you check out and see what people are doing in your area and try and get connected with those local groups too. I think that's all the questions we're gonna take um, for now. Great. Um, well, so this webcast is coming to an end in a few minutes um, and we wanted to make sure that you leave with a solid to-do list. Um, so after you're done watching the webcast, um, if you are watching at a webcast party, spend some time with folks in the room to begin brainstorming and planning your creative resistance action. Um, if you are alone, you can start brainstorming who you want to work with um, or approach about talking about a creative resistance action. And we really want to encourage you to think about working with people that you not only already know, but people who you may not yet know, but who you think may be important to the strategy that you're figuring out. Um, and the best way to, to begin planning to is to use the resource guide and the Creative Resistance Action Plan that we have provided. Um, and so again, you can find information for the 10 in-person trainings and for other resources and links um, that you may need at summeroforesistance.org. And if you have questions or you want to be connected directly with a Summer of Resistance leader, um, you can email us at resist.help.us at greenpeace.org. And when you talk with a leader, they'll be able to um, work with you on you know, a few key things. So some things that you may run into are you know, figuring out how to generate uh, creative solutions to some of the common snags that um, may, you may encounter when organizing an action. Um, the leader can help you think through how to ensure that folks stay safe during your creative resistance, your um, peaceful protests, um, and also just referring you to other helpful resources because there are so many out there. Um, so again, if you want to get connected with a Summer of Resistance leader, the email address is resist.help.us at greenpeace.org. Once you have a creative resistance action planned, post your event on summeroforesistance.org so others can find it. If you are having a hard time identifying what to do for a creative resistance action in your community, don't worry, the resource guide also includes a toolkit to plan a creative resistance action around fighting tar sands pipelines. Last but not least, if you hosted a house party, tell us how your event went by filling out the report back form. Thanks so much for joining us. We are excited for you to launch your peaceful creative resistance actions across the country to push back against the serious attacks on our communities and environment from Trump and his corporate allies. We'll see you in the streets this summer. Thanks. Bye, everyone.